Yes, that's because Windows XP is just my computing nirvana, and just what I strive for in every Linux distro. Oh no! How can I make it the most like XP? Oh my god! (laughs) Triggered. User error fifty four. I'm Joe. I'm Alan. And I'm Dan. And we're back. And a quick plug for the forum again: community dot error dot show. And someone has posted there recently saying that we should probably have a link to it on the main website of error.show. And yeah, I don't know why we didn't think of that. So hopefully by the time this is published, I will have sorted that out. But if not, it'll be shortly afterwards. And uh, if I do forget to do that, then someone remind me. One of you two remind me, maybe. I did. I replied on the forum and tagged you to remind you to do it. Well, you probably have to ping me in Telegram to remind me. But no, I will do it. I promise. Um, so another hashtag ask error special and remember you can use that hashtag ask error on Twitter or Telegram or you can post in the relevant part of the forum to ask your questions. They don't have to be Linux related. They can be of course, but they can just be random life, the universe and everything stuff or technology or whatever you want. So the first question is what do we have to do to get normal people to use proper passwords and backups? Uh, dream on is my answer, but I don't know if you two got any uh, proper answers. So my mother-in-law has a MacBook Air, and I said to her, you know, that that data is in danger because you don't back it up. And she said, oh, I don't know how to do that. And I said, well, it's really easy on on Macs. You know, you just plug a USB drive in, and it's pretty much, you know, I'll, come, I'll set it up, and then that's it. You just got to remember to plug it in every so often. And it is, that is it. That's all she has to do is plug the USB drive in. And she just has to do that once in a while because there's not a huge amount of data on there. It doesn't change that often, but she just has to plug the drive in. And even then, still, she doesn't do it until I come over. And I've written instructions how to do it. You plug the drive in and then you leave it alone and it will back up. And then you can eject it nicely, you know, using the button that is eject, but she still won't do it. And I, d- I don't know what I have to do. To, and, and that's and that's on the platform that ships with a backup tool that's integrated and stupidly easy to use. Like on Linux or on Windows, it's a bit more painful. And I I don't know what I would do on those platforms. But I you know I'll, is it a lost cause? Because even on a platform that's super easy, they don't do it. Yeah, uh, ba- backups a total total lost cause. And I think it's a red herring too. We don't need backup. Like that's not the way people do things anymore. Um, so my grandmother, she has an iPad and an Android phone and, uh, I signed her up for a Google photos account. And whenever she takes photos on her phone, they show up on her iPad and they're all automatically backed up to Google photos. So she doesn't ever do backups. They just are backed up. I think that's where we need to get. Right. And I agree that photos are probably one of the most important things that, you know, I have on my computer maybe. And, you know, having backups of those is, is, is important because it would upset the rest of the family if we lost, you know, 20 years of uh, record of our lives. So yeah, that I agree that that's an important thing, but there's other stuff people have on their computers like documents. Um, she has Microsoft Office because she's 70 plus years old and, um, She's used to using Office products, so she has a local Office product, and they email documents her her local ladies group that get together every so often and go out for dinner. They email stuff backwards and forwards, and if she loses her hard drive, she loses the latest copy of that database and the spreadsheet and the documents. And okay, it's not the end of the world, but it's a pain in the butt if she can't get access to it. But if you have like iCloud sharing set up, then it just does that for everything, everything, documents, music, movies, photos, whatever, like everything just automatically gets synced to iCloud, like anytime anything's saved on the disk at all, anywhere. But my privacy. It's encrypted. Oh, don't be such an Apple fanboy, honestly. Well, no, I mean, I I don't think it's a a fanboyism thing. I think it's a like, that's a consumer product that works. And that's, that's how backup works for normal people is that they don't know that it's backed up. It just is. And then when they get a new computer, they sign into their account and then all their stuff's just there. Like making, making it like that where they don't have to even conceptualize what backup means. Their stuff is always just there. Like that's how you get normal people to back up. Yeah, and to be fair, Apple's business model in this area is much like their other business models, charge loads for it, because the free iCloud storage isn't very much at all, is it? And you pretty much hit that barrier very quickly, and then you're having to pay them monthly. So I suppose I would somewhat trust that it is encrypted and they can't really see what you've backed up there, but I'd still be a little bit skeptical, I think. I feel from past news articles and um, issues where the police have asked Apple to 
unlock people's phones who are suspected criminals or are criminals, I feel more confident that their stuff is secure based on the responses we've seen from them than I would about some other random third party paid service that claims to be encrypted. It it feels like Apple's well tested now. I feel like a lot of Apple's messaging around that kind of stuff uh, is that they do their best to make sure that they don't have the ability to unencrypt things, even if, you know, some government authority orders them to, that they they try to make it so they're physically unable to do that. At least that's what their marketing team says. Mm. So what about on the other platforms? I mean, it's very similar to that on phones and Android devices, which are people's primary computing devices. But what about us in the Linux world? The backup tools we have on Linux are pretty awful. Um, I've, res- oh, I've yeah. resorted to running a script in a cron job that backs up to a hard disk that's attached to my computer via a USB cable. Um, and I and I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, same. I've got that with my NAS. I've got an external hard drive that's plugged in via USB and a cron job. But the problem is I can't reboot that NAS remotely because... It keeps changing its mind about what's SDA, B, and C. And so I have to be there to make sure today when I rebooted it, it was fine. But other times I've rebooted it over SSH and then it's just like not come back up. And then that's because it's changed the the drive letters. So that's really fucking annoying. But um, I can deal with that. But you normally, I couldn't set that up for a normal person because it just, you know, it needs too much maintenance. Right. And I don't know what normal people do. You know, they just don't back up, do they? Right, they just lose all their data. Yeah, I think things like um, Nextcloud maybe, but realistically, Dropbox Mm. is the way to do it. Make sure they're on EXT4, set them up with Dropbox, and if they don't have much stuff, a free account, otherwise pay for it. I mean, that's not what the Linux crowd listening to this are going to want to believe, but that's realistically what you have to do if you want normal people who aren't that computer literate to do proper backups. It's sad though because Dropbox is so like hostile to the platform. Uh, it doesn't like respect anything about it. it's always trying to auto start itself and re-adding itself to auto start. You like can't change or get rid of that. It like hijacks things. It doesn't uh it it uses the old like legacy notifications API from like GNOME 2 days that doesn't even work in the latest GNOME and we dropped the support for that from elementary OS. Like Ubuntu has to like try to patch that stuff back in to try to support these applications because they don't care about the platform at all. So we don't really have like a good story for a cloud. And Dropbox doesn't encrypt at their end. They deduplicate. So yeah, they they we well as far as I understand it, they deduplicate. So if you and I both have the same copy of a file, even if we're not sharing it with each other, there's one copy of that file stored on the Dropbox servers, um, because of the yeah you know, the the dedupe they do with a hash of the the file contents, and they can only do that if the file is unencrypted. Um, I I helped a friend, uh, a friend of ours, Stuart Language, set up backups for his father recently using SyncThing, but that was not straightforward. It wasn't anywhere near as simple as, as Dropbox is, but he has it set up so that his dad's machine synchronizes to his uh, over the internet. So whenever his dad puts new photos on his laptop or PC, they just whiz over the internet magically in the background to Stuart's machine. So he's got an offsite backup of all his dad's stuff. And I, I feel like friends and family should help other friends and family get these things like passwords and backups sorted because people aren't going to do it on their own. Friends don't let friends not back things up. Um, what about passwords? Oh, before we move off backups, my solution for that MacBook is a Fit drive. I think that's, well, uh, certainly the Samsung line are called Fit, F-I-T, and it's just tiny. So you can just leave that in all the time and it's not hanging out and you know breaking the USB port and stuff because normal people don't stick anything in, do they? Like They don't use like a mouse or whatever. So... That's my advice to you there. Give that a go. Yeah, the other brands do them as well, but I've got a really fast USB 3 Samsung Fit 128 gig, which is, if it's not plugged into anything, it gets lost. So that's my other pro tip. Leave it plugged into something at all times. At the moment, it's plugged into an OTA cable. <laughs> I have a tiny, tiny USB drive on my uh, on my desk. It's 128 gig, and it's just floating around on my desk, and I'm going to lose it at some point, so I should plug it in. I should just plug it into the mother-in-law's laptop and say, look, I've sorted your backups now. You can forget about it. Yep. 
exactly. But what about passwords then? I mean, that is just a fucking lost cause, isn't it? So uh, I've been using Bitwarden actually for all my passwords. And now that iOS has native password manager support, like that works awesome on my phone. And I've been thinking a lot about, um, I really want to poke the Epiphany developer and see how hard it would be to get that in there. Because if I could just use Bitwardens to sync my passwords cross-platform like that, just have native cross-platform uh, password manager support, I think that would that would solve it for me. Does um, Bitwarden do the same kind of stuff that LastPass does, like fill in fields on your on your browser and stuff like that? Yeah. So on on the phone, it. Um, because the it's the password manager support is built into uh, iOS Safari that it it just pulls from that password store I guess like you don't really see the application UI unless you like manually go in there to do stuff but it it's all it's all native built into applications and, and things on iOS now nice I don't know what that I think on Android it doesn't work like that and you have a separate app and it has to have permissions to scribble on the screen and like inject key presses into applications in order to inject your password. So something like LastPass on Android works. But I, I'm interested in looking at Bitwarden because I would rather use something like that than, than LastPass. Yeah, there's like a proper native API for it in iOS now so that the, um, all these applications and stuff can just pull from the, the data store of the password manager, which is pretty awesome. And does it work with Google Chrome on the desktop then? Uh, I don't know. I haven't tried it with Chrome. Uh, I use Epiphany on uh, my desktop, so. Do you really? I know that you ship it, but come on, no one really uses it. Yeah, the only time I ever uh, use Chromium is if some website is like, only works in Chrome. Yeah. But other than that, I always use Epiphany. Because Chrome always has all these weird issues where it's like, okay, this week window controls are gone, or like scrolling doesn't work anymore, or like Firefox has weird issues too, where like the version they ship right now, whenever you right click something, the menu disappears automatically, unless you go into like about config and find some setting to stop that. All the non-native browsers suck. So I just use Epiphany because it actually works. Fair enough. But normal people use Chrome, don't they? Yeah. On the whole. Oh yeah, that's true. If we're talking about getting normal people to use proper passwords, then it has to work with Chrome and it has to work with Android and it has to work with iOS. And otherwise, it's just pointless. Well, Chrome has it built in anyway now, has for a while now. So Chrome will just remember passwords for all your websites. Obviously, that doesn't work for applications, but generally most applications people use these days um, have a web backend to them and you will have signed up on the website. So you could probably dig the password out that way. Yeah, but you need something to generate a proper password in the first place rather than just, you know, my mum's name, one, two, three. Yes. So Bidwarden apparently does have a Chrome extension. I'm going to add that right now. Ah, uh-huh. well, that might be the solution then. It might. I'll be interested to hear what our listeners use to uh, coerce people to do backups and what password managers people recommend. Uh, obviously, there's Bitwarden and LastPass, but there may be others. And um, I, I'd like to know what they are that other people use as well, especially for non-techie people like normals. Okay, the next hashtag ask error. What's the most popular movie you've never seen? I'm not talking like technicalities of what's top of IMDb or whatever. <laughs> I'm talking about, you know, movies that everyone's seen, like The Godfather and Back to the Future and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. The, the one movie that everyone else seems to have seen, but you have just never done. So I think uh, Alan posted a link to this IMDb list, right, in the Telegram. Mm. I know you had some issues with that, but I was looking through it, and I was like, I haven't seen so many of these movies. Like, there's so many Holocaust movies on that list that I, I like, never even heard of. Yeah, there's a lot of sort of very serious movies that make it up there, but now I'm talking like, the, you know, the big popular ones, not necessarily popular on IMDb, but just popular by word of mouth, maybe... Maybe I'm wrong in my perception, but um, this is just an excuse to say that I've never seen any of the Lord of the Rings films. <gasps> so, okay, you said most popular, right? Um, yeah. It depends by how you measure that. And yeah, I, the reason I posted the, when you when you first mooted this question, the reason I posted the top 10, uh, top 100 IMDb is simply because it's a good barometer of, you know, films that the general consensus suggests are good. And I'm sure the all of the Lord of the Rings films are in that list. But you also mentioned The Godfather, which is number one on most of the lists that 
that you that you look at on IMDb. And that is actually the one I was going to pick that I've never seen The Godfather. And whenever anyone mentions The Godfather, they always talk about it being a fantastic film. I've never seen Schindler's List, which is also on there, or Raging Bull, or Citizen Kane, or Gone with the Wind, or, or um, Vertigo, or Psycho. So there's loads. And not just, not just, um, Godfather, a Godfather two and three, obviously. I haven't seen either. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch, and I every so often I want to pluck one of these out and watch them, or usually just surf Netflix or scan through TV channels and have it on in the background or something. But I don't know. I think I've gone past it now. I don't think I need to watch those films. I've uh, no. I demand that you watch The Godfather one and two. Don't bother with three. No, I'm not going to bother. I'm ab- I'm actually going to resist that because there are so many other films out there that I could watch. Um, and and that's that's from the past. I don't need to watch that. <laughs> <sighs> well, as, I suppose it is up there with not having seen the Lord of the Rings ones. How does it compare to Casino or Goodfellas? Like, if I've seen Casino and Goodfellas, do I really need to also see Godfather? Well, they're a generation apart. The Godfather is slower and more political and doesn't have a voiceover um and therefore is slightly less accessible but i think it's more rewarding once you watch it immerse yourself in it understand all the politics of what's going on in it but i suppose ultimately you're probably gonna have more fun watching casino or goodfellas yeah i I love both of those films i've seen both of those far too many times but yeah that's a shame isn't it not gonna watch that oh well well maybe uh we could sit and watch The Godfather and Lord of the Rings on two screens next to each other at the same time. (laughs) Right, next question. Is it time to stop making new Linux distros, or was that 10 years ago? I think this came from you, Alan, didn't it? Mm, Maybe, yeah. (laughs) So 10 years ago, around about the time you switched to Ubuntu, funnily enough, is the time that people should have stopped making Linux distros, or at least new ones. Uh, I switched to uh, Ubuntu 14 years ago, um, and I think there was a sweet spot around about that time when a whole bunch of distros were created. Not just Ubuntu, but Mint and Elementary came out quite, you know, around about that time. Um, And I think it's, it's tricky because... Every time I see that there's a new Linux distro, my first question is, what's the unique selling point? What does this bring to the table that other distros don't already have? And I see people making YouTube videos about every single new distribution that comes out. And some of them, some of the distros have interesting uh, selling points and interesting features. Maybe it's performance, maybe it's um, boot speed, or maybe it's a focus on particular types of applications or a particular package management scheme or something. Some of them have a unique selling point, but there are a lot which are just a reskin of an existing distro. Like they're using the existing archives and all they do is change the wallpaper, change the font, maybe move the launcher to another location and you're done. And that's, you know, Bob's great distro version 1.0. Um, and it, and, and it's a, an interesting exercise and it's a learning exercise to make that distro. But I think often those distros should stay on the hard drive of the person who made it and maybe something for them to play around with and to, f- to service their own needs. But they don't need to necessarily do a whole bunch of PR and get a load of people to buy into that distro when in a year's time they're going to forget and drop it and move on to something else and some new shiny thing, or they're just not going to be interested because they've done all the learning that they want to do from making that distro. I just feel like there's a ton of wasted effort spread so far and wide and thinly on a load of distros that don't live for very long. I wonder if it's just a waste of their time. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely a lot of the, like, Ubuntu or Debian base, throw GNOME on it, change some themes, install some different applications or whatever. And and I agree that um, I, I don't think that there needs to be so much effort put into like building out websites and communities and things for these kind of distros that are clearly just some like little personal pet project. You know, this is how I like to set up my thing distros. 
But there is like the, you know, Intel Clear Linux or like Solus or uh, whatever the new Fedora one that's all container is, is or uh, deep in, you know, stuff like that. That is interesting and, and they're doing new things. And so I, I, I think there's definitely more room for people to try new things and push different technologies. And I mean, even uh, something like... Um, what was the Wayland one? Was that the Rebecca Black Linux or was Hannah that Montana. The Hannah Montana? Yeah, where it's like the, you know these kind of like silly distros or whatever, right? But they're they're built for the purpose of like being able to test specific technologies before they're ready for adoption in the big mainstream distros. I think there's still room and interest in those kind of things. Yeah, I think I think there's a room for uh, technology preview or trying things out, and all of the distros you've listed are you know seem to me to pass the Popey validity test. You know, you mentioned Clear Linux, Solus, that Fedora spin that's all containerized stuff. These all seem like great ways to prove some piece of technology or pr- prove some concept. Mm-hmm. Um, but all the ones that have, um, you know, here's my distro with my selection of applications and a new wallpaper, um, and it's a, f- it's a fork of some other distro. Like, if you have some users, some hundreds or thousands, if you're lucky, users who are who are bought into using your distro and something goes wrong where are they going to go to get that fixed you're not going to be the guy who maintains and fixes those bugs in system d or libx 11 or you know libpanga or whatever random library that ma- manifests an error on your system your magical new unicorn distro you're not going to be able to maintain all of those things and patch all those things because you know, one person just can't stretch that far so what ends up happening is those users of that random distro go upstream and they go upstream to whatever your distro was forked from, be it Debian or Fedora or Ubuntu or wherever, and then waste the time of the people who are trying to support users who are using that distro. And we see that time and time again in lots of support channels where people go and ask, how do I fix this bug in you know, random distro XYZ, which is forked off of Debian and go asking Debian people, or they ask Manjaro people if it's a fork of Manjaro. And they've got their own users and they're answering your question rather than answering the question of a real genuine Manjaro user or a real genuine Debian user who's bought into that that system and who can provide feedback and not some random user of a you know, a, a distro five steps down the tree. It just feels like a, a waste of everyone's time and talent to do that. And I, I feel that we already are a small enough community in the free software world that going off and making all these extra distros means there's fewer people working on the core stuff. Like go and work on Debian, that'll benefit so many people. Or go and work on Arch Linux, that'll benefit so many people. Or work on Fedora, that'll benefit so many people. But creating a, a derivative of some other distro three steps down the line helps like uh, you maybe a little bit but doesn't help many other people yes but how are you ever going to have another big distro if they don't start off as a small distro why do we need more new big distros there's already quite a lot of them and the, the ones that exist are able to try out new technologies so intel huge company are able to try out new things with clear linux uh, Red Hat are able to try out new things with their various spins of Red Hat and their community around Fedora are able to try out new things there. You know, you could, all of these people are willing, I'm sure, to welcome new people who want to work on the core product. And like, if someone came along and said, I want to make Fedora boot faster and I've got some ideas how we can make it happen, as long as it doesn't break other stuff, I'm sure Fedora would love to hear from developers who want to make it boot faster. You don't have to make an entirely separate distro to make that happen. Like you could contribute to the existing distributions, surely. I think there's kind of a culture of fork first. You know, and and we've even seen this um, with uh, some of our software recently where people are really quick to fork first. And then after they've made so many changes that it's nearly impossible to merge it back into master, then they're like, oh, okay, like, you know, I've got it where I want it now. Let's talk about getting it upstream. It's like, this is unreviewable, you know, Uh, and I think that that is that is a culture problem that, you know, doesn't just apply to distros is where we need to. Uh, try to collaborate first and only fork as like a last resort. And a lot of these people who create distros, they don't, they don't really think ahead as to what the burden is going to be placed on them. Um, 
when when they put that out there like they put an iso out there on sourceforge or you know mega.co.nz or whatever and someone downloads that they should they just expect no updates should they expect some security updates is the person who maintains this distro on any of the security mailing lists will this will they get cves fixed and the, the expectation appears to be i can make a distro and users will come and use it and they will be fine it'll all be cool and somebody else will sort out all the security issues i, I worry so much about all these people out there are running these random distros that have I don't know. Do they have no expectation of security? Do they have no expectation they're going to get kernel updates and browser updates and library updates and bug fixes that are going to prevent something leaking on their machine? I, you know, I worry about the users as well who buy into these distros. Do you think we need consumer protections? <laughs> <laughs> Regulation. Yeah. Should we set up a, a you know computer security administration and they'll you know give you a stamp of approval so that you're you can distribute your your software <laughs> i don't think it's a problem that people create them like i i created a, a linux distribution and it turns out someone else picked it up and it's relatively popular but i wouldn't have put it online and shared it and set the expectation that that you could use it and expect it to work you know and expect to get security updates that i i would feel under tremendous pressure if that was the case but i feel like people aren't aren't doing that. So I think, I think, no, you don't need to regulate it. You just, people need to have some common sense and maybe not share every single ISO that they make. And people who go looking for interesting new distros to run, maybe should think twice before they try Billy Bob's new distro Mark one, you know, maybe wait until version four or five, maybe. Do you remember back in the good old days when they had that big old, you know, copy pasta that was like, this is not guaranteed for use anywhere with no warranty and like you break it and you get to keep both halves and all this big thing. Remember that? Like now it seems like that everybody's got to build a big web page that says that their thing is like, you know, the super like enterprise ready, fully compatible, whatever, when it's not at all. I, I, maybe we were more honest before, you know, mm. when we shared stuff online that like, this is just my project and I can't support you, you know? And I cringe whenever I see some like funky new distro come out and they say it's an LTS release. I think, ha what are you committing to here? You're like right. one guy who's made a an ISO image, chucked it on SourceForge, and you're telling your users that's LTS for five years because it's based on Ubuntu. So, well, okay, we are doing your LTS for you. Thanks. But what about all the packages you add and all the bits and pieces you add on top? Just because you're based on Ubuntu LTS or you know, whichever other distro has a long-term support doesn't make your distro long-term supported. I agree. We don't we don't say that elementary OS is LTS, even though it's built on Ubuntu LTS, because you guys don't ship a lot of the packages that we ship. That's our responsibility, and we don't make any promises about how long they're maintained because it's hard. Yeah. But if you are going to create a distro, surely the best thing to do is to become an official flavor or spin or whatever, properly hitch your wagon to the distro that you are basing it on. If you really like some new desktop, like the Lumina desktop or whatever, and you want to make an Ubuntu base or a Fedora base with that desktop, then try and work to become official and be able to use some of their infrastructure and governance and all the rest of that to make it have more of a long-term viability. Surely that is the way to do it rather than just throw it up on SourceForge. And That's certainly one way to do it, but some people are averse to bureaucracy and process and documentation and the idea that someone else might say no if you say, oh, well, I want to put the Lumina desktop and I want to make these the defaults and I want to make it, you know, if if someone tries to make an Ubuntu flavor, an official Ubuntu flavor, I mean, you don't get to be a flavor overnight, but let's assume this brand new desktop comes out and someone creates an ISO image. There are restrictions on what you could put on the ISO. You know, you can't just chuck proprietary. Like some people have tried to make derivatives and flavors that have Skype bundled in or Steam or something like that. You can't do that because there are limitations and restrictions. And some people don't like those restrictions. And so they want to go and do their own thing. And so if they do that, then you don't get the benefit of the 
um, pool of people who are working together on a commons, a common archive of of packages, whichever distro that is. You know, if you if you leverage the Arch repository for your distribution, then you should contribute to Arch. Like that makes total sense. If you leverage the Debian repository, you should contribute to Debian because it's it's a two way street. You're creating something that's built upon Debian. They get some benefit from you bringing these new packages, this new distribution, this new desktop into the archive. Um, and you benefit from that pool of software that's available to you in the archive. So, but some people don't want to do that. And I, I don't think it's a problem that we can solve. I, I think it's just, it's difficult because people just want to create new stuff and we shouldn't be there telling them no, we shouldn't be stopping them because you never know who any of these students who are creating a, a new distro are going to be the next Steve Jobs or the next Andy Rubin or, you know, the next Bill Gates or whoever. You just don't know. Um, you can certainly spot the ones who almost certainly aren't. I think becoming an official flavor is something that it doesn't work for everyone. Like for us, um, you know, the things that stopped us from pursuing that route are having to follow Ubuntu's release cycle. Um, so there, there are restrictions about like when we can publish certain types of package updates and things like that, because Ubuntu has certain expectations about how packages get released into the Ubuntu archives. So we, we can't worry. We would lose control of like our software release model or, um, things like the kind of, uh, not being able to destroy Distribute like another repository by default in a, an official flavor would stop us from doing something like App Center. And there's nothing quite like making your own thing, is there? Um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's a, a, so much about making your own thing. Like, sure, people want to be, you know, in, in charge of their own work and things like that. But I, I think at least for me personally, it's, um, you know, it, it's like Alan was saying that you don't want people to be able to tell you no when you're trying to do something, right? I think it's more of like uh, not having those restrictions, being able to kind of define your own constraints. Or you might even say having freedom. Yeah. Okay, what is the most ridiculous pipe dream that you've ever had? You first. Mine's embarrassing. <laughs> No, um, I've had several pipe dreams. All right, I'll tell you about some of the pipe dreams that I've had, and I'll, I'll build up to the most ridiculous one. I want to know where to set my boundary, so that's why I want to hear <laughs> yours first. Okay, so my first ridiculous pipe dream was to become a rock star. I was going to like play the drums or maybe guitar and sing, and I was going to be like super famous and rich and all the rest of it. Suffice to say, that did not work out, although I did learn a lot of skills which I then transferred into podcasting later on. Uh, my next pipe dream was to be a stand-up comedian, and that has not worked out. I mean, obviously, I haven't given up on either of these dreams. What did you do in order to achieve them? Were these just things you thought about when you were laying in bed and going to sleep and thinking, I want to be a rock star <laughs> and then fall asleep, or I want to be a comedian and then fall asleep, or were these things you actively worked towards doing? Well, no, I was like in a band for over 10 years, and we had a record deal and stuff, but it just didn't work out. We just weren't good enough. So I did actively do that. Stand-up wise, I did go to some open mic nights and I my first one I was actually really good at. Um and I just never never was that good again. And uh then I got into another band and that sort of fell by the wayside. Um although I did transfer we'll put it this way, I've never been as nervous as my first ever stand up performance. And uh, I don't think I will ever be that nervous again. It kind of it was like a real face your fear moment. Like once you've done that, nothing can phase you anymore, I don't think. And so doing stuff like Fast Talk Live or whatever, or even Og Camp, which is a sober version of it, um, getting up in front of people is not really stressful for me anymore. And I think that's thanks to having given Stand Up a try. So, yeah, so they're, they're my ones that haven't worked out yet. Uh, my next pipe dream after being a stand up was to become a professional podcaster, and that has worked out. So, uh, I mean, that was a ridiculous pipe dream to become a professional podcaster. But here I am doing it. I feel pre pre on a scale of one to ten, professional podcaster, it, it, like with all due respect, Joe, isn't on the same par as a touring comedian or a rock star. Would you, is that fair? Well, yeah, because if you think about it, they've my my dreams have gone progressively more realistic, haven't they? From <laughs> being rock star to professional comedian, which you know, if I'd worked hard at, I probably could have made a few hundred quid a week at you know more than minimum wage. 
um, driving around the country all the time or even internationally or whatever, just working very hard. And then, yeah, it's sort of fairly similar to that doing the podcasting thing, only it's based at home. <laughs> so it's much easier to do. You don't have to travel around loads. So, yeah, they have got progressively easier. Now, I have they, they are not the most ridiculous pipe dream. Um, that is like... You'll go, you will laugh when I tell you my most ridiculous pipe dream. All right. I'll, I'll, shall I give you a, a one so you can feel better about yourself? Yeah, go on. Uh, I actually went to comedy classes because uh, I too wanted to be a stand up comedian. <laughs> and um, there's a, a pub in um, Ballam, I think, uh, where you could go to comedy classes, improv classes. And I went there um, and. I had homework to do, uh, writing jokes about particular things. And we did improvisation in the back of this, the room in the back of this pub. And it was really, really hard. I, I, it was really out of my comfort zone. I'm, you know, I do a lot of these podcasts and stuff, but I'm quite an introverted person, really. I'm not a gregarious, bouncy, outdoorsy kind of person. And it was really out of my comfort zone to be told. I remember one of the one of the sketches we had to do was say the sentence before the person the other person so you just like working backwards you say the the words the right way around but you just have to try and proceed think of a sentence that precedes the one the other person said and you just do a little sketch of saying things backwards a little bit like um that TV program whose line is it anyway that kind of thing like little sketches like that and that I felt incredibly uncomfortable and there was only half a dozen people in the room who were learning and I thought if I can't do this in front of these half a dozen people there is no way i can do this on a stage in front of like a hundred people in a bar or something yeah but but improv is different from straight stand-up sure i think sure and we were we were doing both and i i couldn't do that oh, right. so that was one yes uh the yeah. other one i wanted to be a pilot um and i when i was younger and i was doing a lot of contract work i was earning quite a bit of money and i thought you know what i could burn this money by learning to be a pilot and i looked into how much it would cost to be a pilot in the UK and it's quite expensive to get your professional, uh, your private pilot's license in the UK because the weather is terrible and there aren't as many airports and you can't fly as often and fuel is expensive and so on. But if you fly to Florida or California, you could do a month long crunch and be a pilot. No way, that quickly? Uh, you could do it pretty quick. Yeah, you, because you can fly every day because the weather's so good and there's plentiful opportunities to fly. Whereas in the UK, it would spread over a very long period of time because you, well, this was when I was looking into it like 20 years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, then I got married and had kids. <laughs> so, um, and realism. That's not a very ludicrous pipe dream, though, is it? That's something that is achievable. I know pilots do exist, and uh, yeah, you know they do that by learning how to be a pilot. Um, and uh, you know, I have friends who I've worked with who uh, send me selfies from their planes, and I think, oh, you bastard! I wanted to do that, but I don't know. Maybe uh, when the kids grow up and when uh, we sell Canonical and we all make our millions, maybe I'll uh, quit IT and become a pilot or something. I on our honeymoon, I I remember sitting in the um, uh, one of those boats that lands on the water. I can't remember what they're called. Um, oh, yeah. but we're in the Maldives and this, this pilot was like barefoot flying this little plane out to the islands. And I thought I want his job, like of all the jobs in the world, like flying tourists and half a dozen tourists to and from the main airport to these little islands. It was beautiful. It was tranquil. He seemed very chilled out. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was my pipe dream, which, uh, yeah, never came to be yet. All right, well, a hint about mine is only 12 other people have done this thing that I want to do. But Dan, what's your most ridiculous pipe dream? I thought you guys said ridiculous, and you're talking about like actual careers that people had. So I'm holding back my most ridiculous. All right, okay. Well, I'll 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 give you guys the real stuff. I won't I won't bother you with like, yeah, I too played guitar on stage for like five people before. But the most ridiculous pipe dream that I've ever had, and I've had serious conversations with several people about this, is going somewhere and establishing like an unincorporated town and making it like a techno communist paradise. We will have no money in our town 
And we won't be like a hippie commune. We'll be like a techno commune <laughs> with automation and robots everywhere. That is fucking ridiculous. It is ridiculous, so. but I, I want <laughs> No, but I, I have real conversations with people about this. Like, how, how would we do this? How do we establish it? How would we design this city? Like, what are the startup requirements? And like, oh, okay, well, we need to like invest in farming machines. And it's a real thing, man. Yeah, as ridiculous as that sounds, it is conceivable. It's not like beyond the laws of physics or whatever. So, yeah, fair enough. Uh, you'll have to tell us more about that at some point. So, right, go on, Alan. What's what's your like real ridiculous one? No, no, I I, I need to wait for yours. Is yours by any chance going into space, into the space station? Uh, oh, no, it's much more than that. Oh, come on. Go on <laughs> Spill. Okay, I want to go to the moon. I want to be the 13th person to walk on the moon. I want to go up there live stream the whole thing with like super high quality cameras like take the best red 16k cameras or whatever to document it all because to be fair last time they went in the 60s and 70s they had pretty shitty cameras and stuff and that has very much contributed to the um <laughs> they had, conspiracy they theories had and all some of the best cameras Hasselblad cameras you could money could buy and ship to the moon like yeah <laughs> but compared to what we've got now they were shit um, just take an iPhone with you. You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I want to be the first person to do a podcast on the moon and, and you know, vlog, whatever. I just I want to go to the moon. And I was thinking I could do some sort of Kickstarter or whatever to do it. A combination of crowdfunding and, um, you know, sponsorship or whatever. You know, Pepsi presents Joe's trip to the moon. It is ludicrous it is i'd have to lose a ton of weight i'd have to stop drinking i'd have to like go to the gym way more than i do now and you know i'd have to do shit loads of training as well and i will probably die trying because it is incredibly dangerous but i still i want to do it I, i'm not i don't even really have any desire to go traveling in the world like to go to you know africa and asia and all the rest of it because it's just boring like so many people have done that but only 12 people have walked on that moon and, you know, on a clear night, you look up there and you think, people have walked on that, man. Uh, it would be, how cool would it be to go and see the flag and see how it's all bleached now and see the mirror and the landers and the rovers and everything and just, like, walk around there and be on the moon? I'll tell you what, Joe. I'll go up there with you. We'll build a moon base. <laughs> would it be a, a techno-hippie commune, by any chance? Yeah, we'll have the entire moon will be ours. Yes. Right, it can't be more ridiculous than that. No, it's it's not as ridiculous actually. I I've I've seen these uh, weather balloons. Uh, you know these videos that people they send a like a GoPro camera up with a weather balloon. I want to go up in a weather balloon, like like almost to the edge of space. Like who was that guy um, who jumped out of a thing really really high up? Did the the yeah the biggest free fall? I don't want to fall out. I just want to go up there. I just want to go as high as is physically possible and stay there. Like not in a rocket, just in a balloon. Float all the way up and slowly, slowly, slowly go all the way out there. It's 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 not completely unreasonable given that someone has already done this and he jumped down. Uh but it's but I want to build the thing myself. I want to like use whatever materials I can find. This is where it gets a little bit weird. And uh, just build it in my back garden and then launch it and just go straight up. Because I love looking at things like Google Earth and aerial views of the places where I live. And I just want to see it with my own eyes, not taken with a satellite camera and not taken with a drone or anything like that. I want to see it with my own eyes. Well, that's not beyond the realms of possibility, is it? I mean, um, Tom Scott sent a bit of garlic bread up there and then <laughs> ate it. So, <laughs> you know, if he can do that, you can send yourself up. I am ever so slightly more portly than a piece of garlic bread. <laughs> well, you just need a bigger balloon, don't you? That's true. I'll tell you, though, my biggest pipe dream is to get a link to our forum on the website, and I did that while we were recording. <laughs> nice. I wonder why you zoned out for a bit there. <laughs>